I'm excited to be here. Oh, and I saw I saw Pablo put a smile back on his face. I'll leave, kick it right back to you, brother. I was worried for a second because it was lagging, but we are officially live for the Not Your Average Investor Show Tuesday edition. Today, I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me as always, they call him GC because he generates cash flow and because his name is Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. Boom. Boom. That's my favorite one so far. I love that one, brother. Good to, be, good to be with you all. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to learn about a topic that I know is really, really on the hearts and minds of a lot of you as investors out there. I was, uh, I was pretty proud of myself this morning when I was like, oh my God, I haven't said generates cash flow, right? <laughs> so that, that was low-hanging I'm, fruit. I'm happy with it. So for those of you that are with us today, welcome. If you are a regular like we have here already, I see the Aaron O'Neill, Jay Cargrove, John Evans, John Hennings, Lee Bishop. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Vinay, good to see you. I made it all the way down to the bottom of the list, Vinay. Unfortunately, you're down there with a V, but I get to see you, buddy. Welcome back as well. And this show is normally where we are teaching you a little bit of something. Sometimes we have an interview. Sometimes I get to interview Generate Cashflow, Greg Cohen himself. And today we are having a battle royale between what is better, cash versus financing when it comes to investing in rental income properties. And for those of you that are here for the first time, the regulars already know this, but this is an interactive call, right? Like you're already seeing it in the chat right now. The best ways to interact with us is to pop open that chat um, button on the bottom left, drop down the blue menu right above where you type that says all panelists and change to all panelists and attendees so that not just me and Greg can see it, but everybody else can see it. And they can also help you answer questions and maybe make a new friend. And then if you want to ask questions, which we highly encourage that you do, I hope that you are asking us these questions. I'm going to play the role of the customer because I am the customer. I'm not an expert like Greg is, but I want to, I want to hear from everybody else. The best way for me to keep track of that is if you pop open the Q&A that's on the bottom right of your screen and in there, if you put those questions in there, I promise you that I will see them. If not, I almost promise that I'll definitely see it in the chat and then I might see it in the Facebook group, right? But the best way to do it is to get in that Q&A box in here in the Zoom room and I will get it asked. And last but not least, if you like what you hear and you want to hear a little bit more and you want to know more about the nuts and bolts of rental income property investing, how to do it, the best markets to do it, download our free investor toolkit with a spreadsheet that you can analyze every single deal. That's the same one that JWB uses on all their deals. And we also use it on Thursday's call when we break down properties. Go to, what is it, Greg? JWBwebclass.com. J- That's sleeping. He's sleeping. <laughs> I got you this time. I wasn't sleeping. I was going slow. Don't they tell you to talk slow when you're in an audience? I was talking slow. You know, I talk quick in this part because nobody wants to hear the warm up here, right? Like I, this is the housekeeping. I want to get to the punchline. I want to get to this battle royale about cash versus financing. And we are there. Ring the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Greg, what do I need to think about when it comes between? Well, I mean, what, what is better? Is it better to invest with cash or is it better to invest with financing in your opinion? The answer is yes. I had a feeling like normal. Yeah. For, for a number of uh, tougher topics, the answer is yes, right? You need to work with somebody and build a plan, really. That's where it really starts. Because for some of you out there, the answer will be cash. For some of you out there, the answer will be financing. And so what we're going to talk about today and, and really the theme of the battle royale is to just give you the knowledge and, and the tools to understand where you are in your investing career and what matters more to you. And when you know that, you're going to be able to make the best decision for yourself. Um, And this is something that we do with every client that comes on board. It's a part of our onboarding process. We actually build a buying plan for you before we ever start to talk about property selection. Because this really matters. This is really cool stuff, but it really matters if you're thinking about building a rental property portfolio. You have to to build it with the end in mind. Um, So, you know, like most great uh, educators out there, when they ask you, you get asked to really Tough question. You say the most politically correct answer, which is yes. And then we're going to dive in a little bit more deeper here now and talk about cash and financing. And let's, let's get some crowd interaction here. I know we have some of our current clients on the call and, and others who are thinking about it. If you invest more in cash, put it in the chat. If you invest more with conventional financing, put that in the chat as well. It'd be great to get some interaction from all of you. And then also, of course, we're here to answer questions along the way. 
Um, so with that in mind, should we start with cash? L let's start with cash, Greg. How about, how about, I, how about I ask you questions um, for my friend that may be watching right now? I, the way that my friend understands is it, it. Is this the same friend who, who uh, <laughs> had no clue about uh, tax saving or uh, legacy building strategies with Al Nicoletti last, last week? You know, I think it's harsh to tell my friend that he had no clue. You know, I think he had a little bit of a clue. He just wasn't fully educated. All right. <laughs> so t take it easy on my friends. <laughs> so let's say I've got, let, let's say I've got a, I've got a friend that thinks that going into debt is bad. They think that you should always just invest with the money that you have and nothing else. What do you say to that, Greg? Well, what I would say is that I usually stay away from always and nevers. Um, but what I can say is if that is your strategy, that is going to hinder your growth, right? Now, and that's not, that doesn't mean it's the wrong thing. But what that means is if you adopt a strategy where you're not going to take advantage of leverage, it is going to slow your growth. Your goal should be a lot lower than somebody else who is going to take advantage of leverage or debt or financing. We say those terms interchangeably, right? Um, and the really cool thing about investing in rental properties is that you know, most people equate higher debt with higher risk, okay? Most people equate higher debt with higher risk. When it comes to rental property investing, because you have the ability to be able to take on financing with really low rates, and with a low percentage of, of uh, leverage, meaning you're not over leveraged, you have this ability. It's a much more risk mitigated way to take on debt than what most people fear, right? So when most people fear debt, they feel like taking on debt increases their debt load, their payments, their risk, and they don't have enough money coming in to offset it. But the beautiful thing about rental properties is that because the interest rates are so low, you can take on this debt and still have the asset pay you over and above that every single month. And when I understood this from the very beginning, the light bulb went off for me because I no longer became afraid of debt. I, didn't, I wasn't afraid of debt and I'm not afraid of good debt anymore because I'm investing in an asset that pays for itself every single month and because I'm investing in assets that appreciate over time. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, any strategy can be the right one for everybody. If it's all cash, just understand that you are placing such a premium on not having debt that it is going to dramatically hinder your growth. And we're going to show a really good uh, example of this from a numbers basis, um, you know, later on. Excellent. And, and Paul is saying in the chat, Paul, you are only chatting to us panelists. If you can hit the all panelists and drop out to all panelists and attendees, everybody can see it, but he puts the magic of arbitrage, right? Like that magic of finding that spread between what you can borrow money for from and the amount of money you can make on that money that's borrowed, which sounds like a really attractive thing that we have hit a bunch uh, during this call. So then let's go back to that, right? If there is, if there is an opportunity to be had in interest rates right now, where you are borrowing money at a rate lesser than what it can return when you're putting it to work for you. What is the argument for investing in cash? What kind of customer, what, what is happening in their life for them to really consider cash from your experience? So if you are somebody who is going to be investing in cash, you're placing a higher premium on cash flow and lower expenses, you're placing a higher premium on positive cash flow, more cash flow, and lower expenses than you are on the return on your investment. So for your assets, you want the most that you can get in cash flow from that asset, you want the lowest expenses possible, and you're willing to give up some potential return on that investment, all right? So Pablo, does that sound like somebody who I just described there? Is that somebody typically who is, you know, maybe, 30s or 40s, you know, young um, in terms of investing um, and has many years before retirement? Or does that sound like somebody who's closer to retirement uh, when I'm describing what they'd be liking there? That, that sounds like somebody who's 
who has less risk is probably closer to retirement and needs to be able to, to, to hedge against any kind of, any kind of like variable cash flow or something like that. Right. Exactly. Right. You want the most cash flow per assets. You want to limit your expenses uh, because prior to retirement, you had multiple streams of income. Yeah. Right. To hedge your bets. And you were willing to take on a little bit more as far as debt in order to have a higher return when you had multiple sources of income, right? You had your active job as your main source of income. Now, as you go to retirement for, and this is a general statement, it's not for everybody, uh, but as you get closer to retirement, people become more conservative and they start wanting to take less debt on and they want their expenses to be lower. And they, they walk into this eyes wide open. We sit down with clients that this might be the right thing for, like a client we're gonna profile here in just a second. And we go in and say, all right, Bob, you know what? If we did this with financing, it would be this return on investment. That's a lot higher, but that's not right for you right now. Right now is max cash flow, And for you and your family environment right now, lower debt, lower expenses is great for you. And you're not as limited by capital, right? You have enough to buy in cash. And we say, let's purchase these in cash, right? So it's, uh, it can be a combination, right? Cash and financing. But at the end of the day, for somebody who is, placing a higher value on max cash flow, you're typically going to be later on in your investing career and willing to accept potent, uh, willing to accept less potential return in order to get more consistency. And when we're talking about ma max cash flow, Greg, my head goes to it's max cash flow because you don't have a mortgage that you're paying. Therefore the rent is all in your pocket. Is there you know, like no part of that rent needs to go towards a mortgage expense. It's all coming to you. Is there anything outside of that that I'm missing? Or is it just that simple? Is that why it's max, max cash flow? For the most part, you've, you've kind of nailed it there. I mean, generally speaking, when you don't have a mortgage payment, payment on average, you're going to generate about $800 a month of free cash flow from a rental property here with JWB, which is a lot more than what you're going to generate uh, if it's finance, right? Finance might be closer to 200 or 250, generally speaking. So your max cash flow there. There's, there's a little bit more with tax savings that you get when you finance a property versus if you buy it in cash. So there's something a little bit there, but overall what you're saying is really accurate. You're just removing the principal and interest component of that mortgage payment that you don't need with a cash purchase. Okay. Zach Correa is putting here in the... Uh, chat. He puts, no matter what any analysis or argument suggests, the better method to be buying investment properties using leverage or with all cash is the, the only route you should personally go is what you are most comfortable with. I really fumbled all over myself making that statement, but essentially sounds like something you agree with, right? That's why you say yes, because it is, it comes down to personal comfort with risk. It comes down to uh, where you're at in life and what you're trying to achieve and cash flow stuff and, and, and that's how, that's how a client is presented that at JWB or do you normally try to push something? You're kind of teeing me up there. You know, I'm going to answer that one, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah I was um, <laughs> you know, I mean, so people just need to understand eyes wide open why that's the right decision for you, right? I have many conversations with my own family that invests with me. And we talk about how maybe cash is the right strategy for them, Right. That's, I have that conversation a lot. I've had actually a lot over the last couple of months of some of my family members have thought about acquiring more properties. And I think I fully believe that's the right strategy for them. Even though I know that I could double or triple their returns if they bought with financing in place, we talk about that and we say, you know what? If, if I got you more returns, would it help you sleep better at night? And they're like, no. Nah. If you went a month without, a, you know, with a vacancy, you know, now that you're retired, would that cause you a little bit of unrest? They're like, yeah. Then I'm like, let's go to cash. Let's go to cash. Let's buy it because they're generally later on. Um, and the truth is they invested way earlier and they bought with financing back in the day. So they already experienced a lot of those returns. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Zach is, is absolutely right. It's not one size fits all. You know, our job here at JWB is to empower you with the answers so that you can decide what the best thing is for you. Um, and it's not always the best return on investment. 
Um, although for many of you, it's going to be pretty eye-opening when we look at the financed component here. Okay, and we're about to get to that. I want to. We have a couple of questions here that I want to hit real quick. Curtis Zimmerman asks, "Does the cash versus financing answer change when investing through a solo K, since non-recourse financing is normally at a much higher interest rate?" So the answer can change. <laughs> so of course, it's dependent on the person and their individual plan, um, but. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch the name. What was the name of the, 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 the Curtis, person Curtis, Curtis okay. Zimmerman. Welcome, Curtis. Kurt, Kurt Zimmerman. So um, it's great to, uh, to have you on the show, Kurt. So yes, the answer can change. In a retirement account, you see a lot more cash purchases in a retirement account. Um, and the reason is because financing in a retirement account is completely different than financing when you're buying outside of your retirement account. And when you're inside your retirement account, generally it works well to, to use financing if you have a longer runway before needing to tap into the cash flow. Simple way to look at this is basically your, your loan terms for a non-recourse loan are generally around a 20 year loan. And you're generally gonna be about cash flow break even through that process, through the term of the loan. Right, so you need to have a longer runway. Now, the benefit of using non-recourse financing is that if you have a longer runway, you can get double the assets so that when it is time to retire, you can have twice the cash flow coming in if you didn't, as compared to if you didn't use non-recourse financing, if you bought with cash. So, you know, the, the question of does it change cash versus financing if it's in your retirement account, um, it can certainly change for some folks. They may still go down the cash route. That's still pretty popular in retirement accounts. A lot of times what we'll do though in a retirement account is we'll do a mixture. We'll do a combination. So for somebody who might have, you know, 10 years before when they, you know, ultimately are going to retire and need to tap into that retirement account cash flow, we might purchase two properties with cash and we might do one with non-recourse financing or some combination to basically kind of mitigate the risk, but also put them in a position of, of success to, to tap into some better returns. Okay, great. And Stephen Block asked in the chat, something that I'm actually pretty curious about because I saw it in our upcoming topics. He asked, can you speak on the C3X model? Yes, Stephen, thank you so much. This started from a post that he had in our Facebook group. Um, and so what, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk through this C3X model or the waterfall approach or the cascading approach. I think we're going to do a whole section segment on this going forward. Um, but for any of you who haven't heard these terminologies before, what Stephen's talking about is basically the ability for you to roll your positive cash flow when you have a finance portfolio, roll that positive cash flow in on your properties and aggressively start to pay down your loans. Almost think about it like with the house's money, right? These assets that you purchase, they have debt on them. You're getting positive cash flow up front uh, each month on top of that. And then you can strategically place that on the property that you choose to, to lower, the, to lower the, um, the debt on it. Now, the key to it is what some people do who don't use this method is they spread out their payments on all of their loans. Let's say they have four properties and they make $200 a month in positive cash flow and they want to do this, they pay all their loans down the same. And the C3X model or the waterfall approach or the cascading method, what that really means is working with a teammate like JWB to help you identify what would be the best loan for you to pay down. And then you attack it with all of your positive cash flow. And when you do it this way, what it does is it pays one loan down much quicker, which frees up more cash flow because you no longer have that principal and interest payment to make there, which gives you a bigger snowball or you know, waterfall or whatever you want to call it, which then helps you attack the next loan. And you can dramatically lower the timeline of when you're going to be even debt free with your retirement account portfolio. So that's a part of the process. We love to go through that cascading effect or waterfall effect, a C3X effect. We do it during our planning call. And, um, and I thought that was a great suggestion, Pablo. So we'll have to put that on a, on a future segment and really break it down a little bit more. 
Yeah, and you know, I I didn't realize that that C three X thing is the waterfall effect, right? The Rachel Richards episode that you can see on the YouTube channel or in the podcast, we hit on that strategy, um, and you guys kind of go back and forth comparing comparing that method versus another, Stephen. So if you want to dive into that in the meantime, I think in like three or four weeks we're going to do one on C three X, but that's a good place to start. So Greg, we got a couple more questions, but I want to I want to start diving into this case study. Um, that you prepared mm-hmm. for everybody. And, and I just want to, you know, why don't you tell me a little bit about Marvin Smith? So Marv and his wife, Denise, are an incredible couple. They joined back in the day before, you know, JWB's had a little success over, over uh, the last 15 years. They joined early on and um, have always been a believer in us. And I always hold a special place in, in my heart for some of those, um, those early adopters, right? And JWB, we kind of, we started in 2006, I'll tell you, we kind of hit our stride kind of 2010, 11, 12, and uh, Marvin Denise came on in 2012. And um, just an incredible couple. It's funny, I get pictures like this of Marv, I don't know, probably once every six months. And he's just a great client, just sends in pictures and talking about his fisherman skills and hunting and all the things that he loves to do. Um, And uh, really goes out of his way to tell my team um, how much we, we mean to him. So with all that being said, it gives us great pleasure to think and, and to look at what we have done together with Marv and really set him and Denise up for success. Um, and I thought it would be a great thing for us to talk through because they came in and their strategy, their buying plan really dictated that they needed to purchase the property we're going to profile in cash, right? So a lot of you are asking me, you know, is it always finance and always cash? You just got to go in eyes wide open. We did this with Marv back in the day. We said, we can go down the financing route. You're in an appreciating market here in Jacksonville. We think that your returns are gonna be noticeably higher if you go financing, but because of where he was in his life and his investing career, we decided we recommended that cash would be the way for him to go. And so I think we first kind of start there with the property um, and then you know we'll kind of go one step farther a little bit later as far as if it was a finance purchase. Okay, sounds good. So you want to take a look at what this? Do you want to look at his stats, Greg, or do we want to do we want to talk about? I, I guess let's let's go over. This is this is what Marvin. You know, these are Marvin's goals, right? Yeah. This this kind of goes in well. This is what all of you will have built for you when you become JWB clients, right? We we build that buying plan as I've mentioned a few times now. We understand what your why is. We have to understand what you're going for to help you and to be a resource to build the right plan for you and to understand if it should be financing or it should be cash. You know, for Marv and his wife, Denise, retirement was, you know, somewhere around 10 years away when they came to us in 2012. And so we instantly knew that we needed to position them. Uh, They had some runway to take advantage of some financing, but we also needed to position them for max cash flow when it came time uh, for them to to be at retirement. so we built their passive monthly income goal. They, they needed to accomplish about $5,000. Um, and we built a plan based on seven properties, seven homes for them to acquire with JWB. Um, now, five of those were in their retirement accounts. So they purchased with cash in their retirement accounts, right? So for all of those who wanted to understand when does that make sense? Well, if you have goals of needing max cash flow somewhere around, call it the five to 10 year window, we're not going to go with all financing in that retirement account, right? Because it's not about maxed return on investment at this point for him, right? We did a little bit of that. We got two conventionally financed properties, but for them, it was about diversification of their assets in their retirement accounts and preparing for max cash flow at, at retirement time. Um, they've also invested with JWB private lending. So for any of those, any of you uh, out there who uh, are current clients, many of us do both private lending and turnkey rental property investing and, and Marv and Denise have certainly done that. And we built a strategy for them to start. And this was a rough strategy, right? We, this isn't, you know, set in stone market dynamics kind of affected this, but what they shared with us is they said, you know, we want to buy and hold for about five years, right? Five years is our minimum that we're going to bring a client on and ask you to hold it for five years because we think that's setting you up for success. And then they wanted to start to liquidate. And what they wanted to do was to take that, the sale, uh, of the property and the profits of the property that they made, and then convert that over to private lending, which uh, has less upside, but has even more consistency. Um, and that worked well with their, what they needed to be at come uh, 2021 um, and, and retirement, um, which is what they're enjoying now. 
That's a, that's a pretty, you know, I never, I had never seen a, an exit strategy point. Is that something, is that exit strategy done before you buy your first house? Is it something that's done as you start buying homes? At, at what point is that bullet point part of the customer's psychology in correlation to JWB? You know, we don't usually define it, to be quite honest. It's not something that we're going to define it at um, right off the bat. Right. We're going to look to make sure that this is a long term buy and hold. You know, what we generally recommend is a 10 to 20 year hold, because at that point, that's where you can start to really count on home price appreciation because you're investing for a full market cycle. Um, at a minimum, we want to make sure people are investing for at least five years. And then really between when you start and between those milestones, you're in direct communication with your portfolio manager all the time, right? At least once a month, we're having one of these phone calls. So it's more of one of those things that we're going to stay in touch. We're going to talk about it. We're going to have a planning call at least once a year for you. And we're going to see if things change. Similar to how a financial advisor might ask you those types of questions. We're going to do that specifically about rental properties. You know, we, we've been talking more and more, it feels like, of the portfolio manager. And it's something that I, I love that we're bringing that up more just because I I love the idea of having somebody that checks in on you, not just your property manager of you got to fix the toilet, but the a portfolio manager that is kind of keeping you in line with your financial goals and adjusting as you go along. I think that's, that's something exactly. I like to highlight when you bring it up. Most people, when they buy rental properties, they have no long-term plan. They have no buying plan. They have no long-term plan. There's no management of that plan along the way. If they're lucky, they get a property manager who, who answers a phone call right? This is a much different type of approach. Okay. And, you know, real quick, I think you can answer this quickly. Stephen Block asks in the, in the chat, that exit strategy, right? Is the selling of the property on the open market or do they sell back to JWB or to another JWB investor? Generally speaking, your best approach is going to be selling on the open market, right? Because we're here to try to deliver the maximum return on investment for you. And so in this property that you're going to see here, Marv actually sold this property on the open market, did not sell it back to JWB, uh, which is great because that's the best return on investment for you. JWB is an investor. And if you're selling to an investor, you're not going to be selling it for top dollar. So we always want to position you to get top dollar. Um, so this is not uh, Marv selling it back to JWB. That's not something typically that we talk about or do a lot because at the end of the day, we want you to get max dollar. Um, in rare instances, has it happened? Yeah, we've been able to do that with clients. But again, you go into that with eyes wide open and that's a client who says, you know, I, I am understanding that I don't want to take on the additional risk of it being on the market for a few months or whatnot. I'm willing to accept a lower purchase price for JWB to purchase it back. And it's pretty few and far between that that's the right move for people. Awesome, man. All right, let's get into the, uh, you know, Greg, no, no pressure, but we got 52 people with us today, which is pretty freaking awesome on a Tuesday. So I, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's here. Let, let's get into, let's get into the property itself. Let me, let me put this on the screen and talk us through some of this stuff. Cause I see some interesting things here. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the property that we helped Marvin Denise purchase back in 2012. It's the address right there, 2163 Thomas court. And this is in one of our four main neighborhoods. 32207 is the South Side area of Jacksonville. And there's a picture of the home there. Um, and, you know, some interesting, interesting things to point out. We get a lot of questions on the show here and on our initial phone calls with clients. And they ask about things like school rating. There you go. Crime rating. They ask about neighborhood walkability. Let's kind of look at what we see here, right? We speak a message which is different than what most people have heard which is that your sweet spot for investing in rental properties are those below middle income neighborhoods, right? We want to be below middle income because that's where you get an asset that pays for yourself, pays for itself every single month, right? And we want to be in a, in a market like Jacksonville, which has the potential for long-term growth. And you want to be surrounded by a team like JWB to put it all together for you, right? But a lot of folks, come in with a different mindset. They put themselves in the shoes of their resident and think that it's only a good rental property if they could rent that property themselves. And we're very quick to point out that that is not the goal of this investment, right? You got to separate where you're creating a great investment and a great living situation than 
separate that from where you would be renting. Because if you try to accomplish everything, you're going to fail. <laughs> Something's going to fail along the way. Um, and this is, you know, a very normal example, like every property we sell, but I wanted to point this out here. So this, this client or this property was purchased in June, 2012, purchased it for $90,000. And for Marvin Denise, this was one of those ones in the self-directed IRA. So it made sense for them to purchase all cash. Uh, four beds, two baths, 1,665 square feet. Very normal for us. And your school rating is below average. All right, this is off of the, uh, the Zillow or Trulia ratings there. Um, and so you're going to see below average schools in below middle income neighborhoods. And this is, this is okay, right? Crime ratings, medium, right? Vast majority of crimes there are going to be kind of, call it crimes of opportunity, right? Nonviolent crime are the type of neighborhoods that we want to be in, right? But there's, crime happens everywhere, right? And it's okay to be in a neighborhood where there are, call it crimes of opportunity that happen by people having too much time on their hands um, versus violent crime. We do not want to be in neighborhoods with where there's um, a high amount of violent crime. And there's not here in Thomas, but overall, you're going to see a medium rating of crime. Neighborhood walkability, 36 out of 100. I'm pointing these things out, not because I care about these metrics. I'm pointing them out because these are questions that we get. These metrics mean very little to me, right? As long as you're in a neighborhood that um, has kind of below average schools, right? Your crime rating somewhere in the middle, right, of, of it neighborhood walkability, I had to look that one up for the first time. That never focuses, you know, sometimes I get questions about how close are we to grocery stores or all these other things. My team and I never look at that. But I wanted to point that out there that this is the type of asset that we put our, our name behind, that we invest our own money for ourselves. And that's where we would be putting you all as well. Yeah, and you, and you do it again. I'm, I'm just recontextualizing as the listener here, right? Just from having heard this a lot, I think it's worth repeating. You do it from the standpoint of that's where the cash flow sweet spot is, right? That is where there are homes where the renter is renting, not because they're paying less in rent, but because that is their situation. And that, that's, where, that's where it happens, where you can invest in something. And that's just how it is, right? Kind of. Yeah. You know, if we chose to go to a quote unquote nicer neighborhood that had seven ratings of schools and low crime and walkability scores of 80 out of 100 or whatnot, your mortgage payments would be so high because your purchase price would be so high because you have people buying there instead of renting that you would be cash flow negative every single month. And that's a liability. That's, we do not do that, right? We want you to buy assets. Now, the tricky thing is to be able to buy assets in a neighborhood with positive cash flow, in a decent working class neighborhood like we have here for this home on Thomas, and to do it in a growth market, right? Most of the times when you buy rental properties, if you can get positive cash flow, you're in a similar type of neighborhood, but it's in a non-growth market. You're in Cleveland, you're in Kansas City, right? You're in Birmingham, you're in Memphis, right? These are markets that have not proven to grow at the same rate. So the key here for JWB and for our clients is let's find those positive cash flow opportunities. You're going to do that in below middle income neighborhoods. We're going to go into this with eyes wide open, right? These are neighborhoods that we know, love, and, and have a lot of experience here at JWB, but they're not necessarily going to be neighborhoods that you may want to rent in yourself. You may, you may, you may not. It doesn't matter. It's about creating a really amazing living experience for that resident, much better than what they have the opportunity to rent from anywhere else. And then of course, putting yourself as an investor in a place to benefit from positive cash flow as well as long-term growth um, overall. You articulated that a little bit better than I did, Greg. I congratulate you. So before we move on, I'm going to show now the sale of the property, but Pat Staub had a question in the Q and A. I just want to address it because she, um, Pat asked if this is going to be published live, if this webinar, wh where it goes after this. And I just want to tell anybody, because I, I think that's driven by the fact that it's 1 p.m. Maybe you have another meeting going on right now. 
just so everybody knows, this is live inside of our Facebook group. It's a Facebook group that has 1,700 people, investors, uh, you know, real estate professionals, people, people, people like us here. Um, so we encourage you to join that jwbfacebookgroup.com. I'll put it in the chat. Then about a week later, it goes on the JWB uh, YouTube channel. And that you can just go to YouTube, put in JWB Real Estate Capital and find it. And then a couple of weeks after that, we release it as a podcast. So there's plenty of opportunity for you to consume this if you can't stay for the whole call. But if you just want it right now, and, and really, I just recommend being part of the Facebook group, right? It's our, it's our little cool club, right? Where we all hang out throughout the week. Greg goes live in there. We all interact in there. It's a great place to be. I'll put the link in the chat. But without further ado, I want to I wanna talk about the sale of this property, right? So we had, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this thing back on. And we started yeah. with ninety thousand dollars purchase price on uh, June two thousand twelve, and when it sold, Greg, you want to do the honors? Check out that sale date today. It's, it's today. Today. <laughs> today is the sale day <laughs> that the property is sold. Look at that sales price, Pablo. Look at that sales price, man. That's beautiful. So, okay, obviously we we chose one, and this. And obviously we, we chose one that the sale has happened, right? And it's not a surprise to many that the market has gone up more in the recent months than it does normally, right? But at the end of the day, you're investing in Jacksonville because you see the value of positive cash flow, incredible team, and the potential for long-term growth. And, you know, historically Jacksonville is appreciated at a 4.3% rate. That's the historical average appreciation rate that we would expect for a full market cycle. You know, it's pretty cool that Marvin and these timed this one well, because over the time period of when they started to invest until now, when they sold the property, the market has appreciated, uh, or excuse me, this property has appreciated at an 8% rate every single year. Um, so the sales price there, for those who are listening to this eventually on the podcast, $170,000 is what uh, Marvin and these are selling this property for today after owning it for a little bit over eight and a quarter years here. Right. So it appreciated from $90,000 to $170,000 in a little bit over eight years here in Jacksonville. Again, recapping for anybody that's on the phone, listening on the, listening on the podcast. So what's next here? The profit centers, right? Let's, let's, let's talk about this, Greg. So I see, I see here, you have a, a chart that has the profit centers. They made in a little bit over eight years, $48,000, $48,694 in net rental income. Can you tell me what goes into net rental income? Absolutely. So net rental income is all of your rents that are earned over the years, subtracting out all of the expenses that come along the way, right? So subtracting out, right? There's no mortgage payments here, but you're subtracting out your property taxes, your insurance costs, you're subtracting out your property management fees, you're subtracting out your maintenance costs or your vacancy costs would reflect here as well. So you're taking all that out and that's that net rental income, what actually shows up in their pockets after owning this property for a little bit over eight years. Okay, great. And then let's go down the line here. Um, tax savings, not so much, zero for tax savings and zero for, for principal pay down. Now, is this, do you not get tax savings because you don't have a loan on this property? Is that why that's happening, Greg? No, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question. You get tax savings if you purchase a property in cash, um, if it's outside of your retirement account. Mm -hmm. um, if it's inside your retirement account, the tax savings are already built in, so you don't get extra tax savings in your retirement account, and that's how Marv purchased this. So that's why that's reflecting zero there uh, for tax savings. That makes a lot of sense. So then there is, so there is tax savings in cash, just not inside retirement accounts because that tax is already deferred and you're already benefiting from that. Principal pay down zero. That makes sense because there is no principal to pay down because you bought it all cash. And then a whopping home price appreciation mm -hmm. of $80,000, which is really spectacular. So, so I'm looking at these numbers, the juxtaposition of these numbers in eight years, net rental income averages about $6,000 per year and appreciation averages $10,000 per year. And this was a good time to buy. Like we should make sure that people understand this, right? This is not normal. A normal appreciating market would be about half of that. But at the end of the day, even for a cash purchase, a huge chunk of your overall return on investment 
comes from home price appreciation. And I feel like I'm on a mission to help people see beyond just net rental income, right? You need to see beyond just net rental income. You need to look at all of these profit centers if you want to make the best return decision for you, right? The best risk adjusted return decision. So yeah, that's a great segue here. This is the total return on investment. You know, Marvin Denise basically gave JWB or invested $90,000 right off the bat. And over eight and a quarter years, we returned back an additional $113,000 in the form of net rental income plus home price appreciation. Uh, so a huge win. When you look at the numbers, the total return on investment is actually just a shade above 12 and a half percent. So 12.6% is the IRR, the internal rate of return, which is a huge win. When you look at what the original expectations were, my team is built on telling you something and then hoping and praying and working our butts off to do a little bit more and hopefully a lot more. Well, that's what we've done here, right? We told them to expect 7.8% when they initially invested in this purchase and we returned 12.6. So almost doubled the performance for this asset within JWB, which is what we take a lot of pride in. Excellent. And Greg, correct me if I'm wrong here. This is, this is uh, not having to do with this, but we have somebody here. Their name is Innovation Health. I'm assuming that that's their company. Um, shout out to Innovation Health. <laughs> They're asking, how can I get a copy of this recording again? I kind of went through the different times that we publish this stuff. But am I wrong in that, the, that you also email this recording to everybody um, in a couple of days, the, the YouTube? Or is that oh, you know what we do? Week? We offer a replay of this session. That'll be on Saturday. And so for anybody who would like to, you know, didn't catch the whole thing, you can just email, uh, however you got the email invitation to join this thing, just reply to that one. It'll come to my team and then we'll get you set up for the replay. And then we also send an email to every client who's on our client email list, inviting you to watch the replay on Friday. So even if you don't email us, you'll get an invitation to watch the whole thing again uh, this Saturday. That's, that's what that is. And, and, and by the way, I just, I, I again want to reiterate Innovation Health join us in the Facebook group. It's, it's really worth your while. That's, you know, there's a lot of value exchange that happens there and, and you can really just see for yourself and meet the people that are on this call right now and ask them if these are the real numbers that they get too, right? Like if this is, if that's where you're headed. So go to jwbfacebookgroup.com. I'll put it here in the chat, but let's get back to this property, Greg. So, so we have this, we have this outstanding return, $113,000. Um, and here you have a chart that says what happens if they would have bought with conventional financing. So maybe you can talk me through this, but the purchase, the purchase Pablo, would have been. Can I stop you for a second? You didn't yeah. really seem that excited about overperforming by about, you know, doubling that performance, by the way. It, it didn't really seem to matter to you. You're right. <laughs> You're right. I got, I got, I got lost in the little things. I got lost in the I'm little just things. messing with you, brother. You're right. Right. We, uh, we love that fact. That's why we, why we're here, but you're right. We wanted to take that next step. I was just calling you out, man. Yeah, it's, it's awesome, dude. It's awesome. So, so going back to it, you promised, what'd you promise? You, you expected 7.8 and you returned 12.5. So you outperformed it by more than 50%. It right? just feels so good when you say it. It's just it incredible. Is, it is good, man. It is good. Right. Like I, you know, you know what threw me off, Greg, is that you said something like, Oh, we promised this thing and then we hoped and prayed and this and that. But I'm like, you don't hope and pray to deliver what you promise. Yeah, you, true. you, you hope and pray to over deliver, which is, yeah. which is what, which is what knocked me off there. I thought you undersold yourself and then I came <laughs> off it for whatever reason. Man. <laughs> so, yeah. So we wanted to take the next step, which is, all right, this is a case study in, cash versus financing. So we just walked through a current client and the right thing for them based on who they are and where they were in their investing career was to buy with cash. Now, what if they made a different decision? What if life was different for them where they were in their investing career and conventional financing made sense? I thought this would be a really cool exercise. So that's what uh, we did. We put the numbers together for this same property uh, but it was purchased with conventional financing. And I assume that they could do it outside of the retirement account, right? So this was the assumptions here is with conventional financing, they put 20% down. Uh, we assume that there's a 4% interest rate. I chose that because that's the interest rate that's available today for investment property loans, which is incredibly low. Um, and then it's a typical 30 year fixed rate loan. That same purchase price of 90,000, you'll have some closing costs. Your closing costs or financing are gonna be a little bit higher than if you purchase with just cash. 
Um, so we reflected that here. And your down payment is now only 18,000. This is so critical, again, as we see some of the, the upcoming uh, numbers we're gonna look at. The down payment is critical. Um, $18,000 plus your 2250 means that your total initial investment for Marvin Denise would have been just over $20,000 instead of over $90,000 to purchase the same property. Okay, so that makes sense. So I'm hearing that you were getting a property for a, a little bit, a, less than a quarter of what you were taking the cash out of your own pocket to put it in under different circumstances if that's what you wanted to do. Yep, absolutely. Okay, all right. So then at that point, we get profit centers of net rental income of 14320 Now, so I, I, I forget, is it seems like that's more net rental income or is it less net rental? It would be less, less net rental. Less. I'm so glad you were kind of highlighting that, yeah. right? If we, and we don't have to go back a few slides, but that number before was 48000 and change when you were buying with cash. Now your net rental income is a lot lower. Why is that, Pablo? Because now you're not having to pay down a mortgage. Well, now you have to pay down a mortgage. Now you are. Yeah, now, yeah. now you have to pay down the mortgage, right? You didn't yeah. have the mortgage payment to make every single month before, which is why that net rental income before was so much higher, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for a financed return, your net rental income, your cash flow every single month is going to be lower, right? If we go back to kind of like when we started this call, you know, typical uh, cash flow for a, an all cash purchase, call it about $800 a month right? Typical cash flow for a finance purchase, call it 200 to 250, right? That's what you're seeing over eight and a quarter years of ownership, roughly. Um, mm -hmm. That's the difference. And then, okay, so I see that, right? So 14 as opposed to 48, but mm -hmm. there is a tax savings of 7,316, even though it was in the retirement account or no, this wouldn't be in the retirement account. No, no this I chose this this is outside of the retirement account okay. because you cannot get conventional financing inside your retirement account. Mm -hmm. So this just shows the, uh, the effect of tax savings purchasing conventionally financed, right? Yep. What, when you buy with financing, you get a higher percentage of tax savings because the write-off that you get from depreciation, right? It's a tax term of depreciation, right? This is not your market value going down. This is a tax write-off that you get from the IRS. You're able to gobble up a higher percentage of the rental positive cash flow with this tax write-off, right? Comparing it to all cash, you have $48,000 worth of income. You're not going to be able to write all of that off with the write-off, right? When you go to a financing basis, your write-off is much more powerful because you have less cash flow coming in. So the tax savings here is more beneficial when you're buying with conventional financing versus if you bought this property in all cash. Okay, so that, that makes sense. And then there's another profit center that we didn't have before, which is the principal pay down. That's of $12,288. So how is that, how is that a, a profit center, Greg? Isn't that just kind of paying back money that you rented, that you, that you borrowed? Well, Pablo, let's say that you have a loan that you take out today. It's $100,000, all right? And then tomorrow, you only owe $88,000 on it, all right? Would that be $12,000 additional in your pocket that you earn somewhere along the line? I would have to say it is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You're paying back a lesser loan, and the way that it happened is that it came from your resident paying. This isn't you paying it down. This is like Pablo's great uncle throwing 12 G's into that loan that you just had. And now you only owe 88 on this it. This right? is Theo Pablo. <laughs> I met your uncle. I saw a video. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that guy's amazing. He would definitely do that for you. Yeah, way. he's a cool dude. <laughs> um, your resident is paying this down because you're investing in positive cash flow assets. Every single month, there's a certain amount of principal that goes to pay down your loan. And when you rack up the, the, the principal pay down over, eight and a, in a quarter years here, that's over $12,000, right? We should be thanking our residents. It's one of the reasons we wanna treat them like gold, right? It's because they do an incredible amount to pay down the loan for us. And it's a huge benefit. 
That's awesome. And we only got like two more slides here and then we're going to get into questions, but you know, I, I, I see this now, right? And then home appreciation is the same, right? Home appreciates the same amount during the same, the same period. But I do a little bit of quick math here, right? Like 14 plus 7 plus 12 plus 80, you know, whereas before we had $128,000 in cash in, in, in profit center, um, you know, bank account number. Uh, now we have closer to like 133-ish, right? So we're like $15,000 less. But then when I look at this return on investment, it jumps from uh, what what was it before like fourteen percent? It was twelve point six. It was twelve point six. Purchase. Yeah, to twenty nine point nine percent total return on investment IRR on a return of ninety one thousand dollars one hundred seventy eight, which is um, basically the the doubling the price of the house. Why is the why is that percentage so much higher, Greg? It's because of the down payment. Right. So what you just reflected there, and if we want to go to the next slide, I think it's, it'll be a nice kind of clear way to look at it. Let's look at what we just did here, right? This is uh, that property purchased with conventional financing on that column uh, versus being purchased uh, in cash, right? And your total initial investment, which makes up is made up of your down payment plus your closing costs for a conventionally financed purchase. You only put down a little over $20,000 here. For a cash purchase, you put $91,500 down. So what you reflected is down there at the bottom, the total return on investment in dollars, it's higher for cash. You earned more net dollars for your cash purchase, right? For conventional financing, you still earned a lot. It's 91,000, but you earned $113,000 net additional return on investment for your cash purchase. So conventional finance, lower net return in dollars. But when you look at it as a percentage of what you put down, that is why investing with financing can create such higher returns, especially in a growth market like Jacksonville. That's the biggest difference. Okay. Okay. I get it. So it's the idea of making $113,000 off of your $90,000 versus making $91,000 off of your $20,000. So then I, I look at this and I extrapolate this and I'm like, so that means that he could have bought four of those for $20,000 exactly. for the same amount of money down. And then that's crazy. Exactly. So for those of you who are in a spot in your investing career with your family, right? With your finances that taking on financing uh, may be the right thing for you. It is such an opportunity. Uh, today. This does not apply to everybody. As you just saw, I, pers I, I put Marv into a cash purchase before because that was the right thing for him. And there will be some clients that it'll be the right thing for. But if you're in a position where you can take advantage of financing, go back to that slide there, right? Think about, think about what this could do for your career, your, your, your financial goals, right? The initial question you asked me, Pablo, is, you know, is investing in cash the right approach? If somebody truly says all cash, I don't want to take on any financing. Is that the right approach or the wrong approach? It can be the right approach. It can be the wrong approach. But you got to understand that with financing, if Marv had purchased four of these instead of one with cash, his total return on investment dollars would have been about $360,000 on a $90,000 total investment versus 113,000, right? This is how you can start to build a portfolio today. Maybe you're 20 years away from retirement. Maybe you can use debt to build up three properties, four properties, five properties, and do the heavy lifting now, right? Build that and then hold on for a full market cycle and have, call it a quarter million, a half a million, dollars of an investment portfolio right there. I'm throwing out large numbers here. I want you to get the, the idea here, the theory here. And that's one of the reasons why um, I talk so much about understanding what smart debt is, because it's a tool when used appropriately. And if you can invest in assets that pay for themselves every single month and appreciate over time, that is one that those are two of the, of the, the main staples of using smart leverage. This is really cool, Greg. I've never been, uh, I've never been walked through this like, you know, like we're doing today. Like I think this is for anybody that's new here, 
um, this is the first time that we're doing this like case study like this. I think it's really, really illustrative for someone, for someone like my friend who doesn't have all this experience that you, Greg and Lee and, and Sean and other people and Zach and other people in the chat that are clearly very highly educated on this. Um, I think it's really, really powerful. And I'm just going to read this out so we can get to the questions. But, you know, we got a little testimonial from Marv that says, your company is the reason we have been able to live the life we do and just use some of our earnings to purchase a tree farm in Alabama. We diversified our portfolio even more. Rental properties, real estate, stock market, hard money lending, and now Timberland. We are blessed and thank you and your team for what you do for us. And that was Marv Smith on March 20th of 2020. Not, not that long ago. That's really, really cool, man. That's in, really, really cool. in the midst of the pandemic, might, might we add, right? <laughs> That's right. While the That's world's right. on fire, Marv's, you know, with his tree farm and, uh, and, and doing something that means, I mean, those words mean, mean everything to us. So pretty That's awesome. That's pretty epic. Yeah. My, Margaret, Margaret Smith puts in the chat here. Damn. <laughs> she, <laughs> she wrote it just for all panelists. That's awesome, Margaret. Uh, so, I mean, you know, Zach had put in the, in the Q and A, he put, Cash flow versus equity, which pays off for investors in the long run. Sounds like that's a pretty clear, if it's a long run thing and you are, and you are waiting on father time, mother time, whatever you want to call it, um, the biggest return comes from uh, you know, equity and, and, and betting, in the, betting the long game in an appreciation market like Jacksonville. Yeah, take this to know that this term, this amount of home price appreciation is not normal. Right? Could it happen if you started to invest now and held on for another nine years? Maybe. Um, you should plan on it appreciating at about half this rate, right? But half of what we just showed you is, I'm just ballparking, but call it a 15% return on investment when it came to the IRR for finance, right? Still incredible amounts of return, uh, return there. So this is not normal, right? It's heavily dependent on how much the, the market appreciated but at the end of the day, you've got to be looking at appreciation rates for the market because Jacksonville doubles the appreciation, almost doubles the appreciation of other comparable cash flow markets. And most investors never look beyond cash flow. And if you didn't look beyond cash flow here, you would have missed the vast majority of the return for Marvin Denise here. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So markets like your, uh, arch rival of your life, Cleveland and Jake Hargrove, who puts in the comments here. This was amazing. Jake's from Memphis, right? Jake, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about investing, think about it, man. You know, you're, you're going to want to, you're going to want to think about uh, Jacksonville here, whether it's with JWB or not. Right. Um, okay. So let's get to some questions here, uh, Greg, in, in, in a couple of minutes. Zach Correa asks, what are the risks involved with leveraging rental properties? Well, what are the risks uh, is that if you do not have a diversified portfolio, right? If you only have one financed property, then you're going to have, you're going to be more susceptible to maintenance and vacancy risk, right? If your, if your resident is not in the home, you're not collecting rental income, then not only are you going to have your typical expenses to pay every single month, right? You're also going to have a mortgage payment to pay every single month. And so this, concerns a lot of individuals out there. And that's one of the reasons why they don't take advantage of even incredibly low financing rates right now. They're concerned about that. One of the things we help clients do is build a diversified portfolio. We love to work with clients that purchase one finance property right off the bat. It's incredible, right? We love that. I certainly don't want to downplay that at all because everybody should get started. Um, if it's obviously, if it's the right thing for you, you should get started. But one of the conversations that we're going to have pretty early on is that, you know, for this to make sense, for this to, you came to us for consistency. You came to us so that we could be a better alternative than the variability of the stock market. You need to have a diversified portfolio. You need to have at least three properties in your portfolio for us to be able to perform consistently for you. Because if you only have one, we're either going to be your hero or we're going to be the goat right? The bad type of goat, right? Not the greatest of all time, right? When it's rented, you're going to love us. If you only have one and it's not rented, you're not going to like us. It's going to be a down year for you. And so the consistency happens when you have a diversified portfolio. So obviously being able to finance properties allows you to, to acquire more of them. That's why a lot of our clients will purchase three right off the bat. They can take that one down payment that they could have used with an all per cash purchase and turn that into three properties 
that are financed and it allows them to build that instant diversification. Awesome, man. Yeah, we call that buying in bundles, right? Buying in bundles. We love buying in bundles. <laughs> oodles, oodles of properties. Speaking of Margaret Smith, whose mind was recently blown, she has a specific question here that you were referring to, rates. About, the ra about what are the rates now for an investment property with a standard bank versus a non-recourse bank? I have a Roth and need to use it. I'm in my late 60s, sometimes called an ender. I've never heard that before. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that either. <laughs> um, all right, so a few different questions there. Conventionally finance rates right now, you're seeing 4% um, for investment properties here in Florida. Um, and, and so that's on all of our property valuations. For any of you who haven't uh, downloaded the free investor toolkit, you can go to jwbwebclass.com. You can get that. And um, on there, you'll see how we break down our properties and you're gonna see a 4% rate uh, noted there. Um, that's for conventional financing. Non-recourse financing is completely different. Well, there's a whole show that we could probably do on that. Um, that's where you're getting financing in your retirement account. Right now, you're seeing about 7.5% for your interest rate for non-recourse financing. And, there's, and that will work really well for some clients. Generally, if you have a longer runway, that can work really well. It will not work well for some clients um, like Marv, who needed to retire in five or 10 years. We're not going to put you in um, non-recourse financing there unless we did a mixed strategy. Um, and then for you, knowing, I, I believe you said you were, uh, you, you're an ender, right? Ender. Closer, closer to retirement. I like that. Ender. Um, so, and you have a Roth, um, non-recourse financing sounds like it's probably not going to be the best thing, especially if it's just one property that you're looking to purchase. Um, at a minimum, you need about $70,000 if you're going to take out non-recourse financing. Um, but one thing that I'd encourage you to do is reach out to my team and talk about private lending, because that might be a great strategy for you, knowing that you're getting closer and closer to um, retirement, consistency of income is important, um, and private lending pays a 10% interest rate, um, and uh, the minimum is much, much uh, lower. So there you go. Hopefully that helps you and uh, appreciate the new terminology. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Margaret, and I hope, we, I hope we have you around some more. So I, I put in the chat here, if you want to schedule a call with the team, go to chatwithjwb.com.